series, Walking Away with our lead pastor, Matt Nelson. No one ever asked me in my life, hey, what's the reason that you would walk away from the church or your faith? That just wasn't asked. Like, we are not comfortable in that space because, you know, faith and belief is the removal of doubt, as so we say. So we never created these safe places for people to struggle well. I want to struggle well. I, I tell our people all the time, it's not if you struggle, it's how. And so struggle well, lean in instead of feeling like you have to go outside of this community because struggling within community is way too messy. Well, messy is what you get. Like that's life, that's wrestling with faith, that's, that's theology. And now we're just, we live in a time of like certitudes. You know, it's just, it's frustrating to me because instead of creating open places for us to dialogue about the non-essentials of our faith, we just kind of feel like we have to do it outside community. Right. That's sad to me. Hey, good morning to you. I want to say thank you for so many of you in this series that have submitted uh, your struggles. And so when we did this, we added this to cc.guide at the beginning of this series. I honestly thought there may be a few people that would share with us what your struggle was with the church or with your faith. We literally had hundreds of submissions, more than I ever imagined, and uh, were unable to tackle all of those. And so we just did our latest podcast that we launched, Reflections on Now. Uh, we take the gospel in everyday life, uh, Cody Jensen and I, and we wrestle with them. And we wrestled with a lot of your submissions. So things that you've asked about doubt and church heard and the inerrancy of scripture. And we kind of wrestle through those. And how many know you can listen to stuff and you don't have to agree with 100% of it for God to do something and for you to learn and grow. And so we just openly wrestle with some of those things. Uh, we've dealt with a lot of those over the last few weeks. And so you can check that out. I want to say thank you for that. Uh, thank you for you who are worshiping inside with us today. So glad that you're here. Some of you are outside. Um, so glad that you're, you're with us outside. And then some of you are online, both live, and you'll watch throughout the week. We're so glad uh, you're with us as well. Next week, we will be wrapping up the series, uh, Walking Away. Uh, it's been uh, wildly popular, better than I've ever, ever imagined. And one of the great things about this series is it's opened up honest conversations. And I think the place to start with doubt and unbelief and all of our struggles is honest conversations. We have to be willing to admit it. And so many of you have, have allowed us to enter into your life as you struggle with things. And I want to say thank you for that. That's how we journey together uh, on this journey of faith together. Next week, the last week, one of my best friends on the planet, Mr. Blaine Bartell, will be speaking with us uh, here at City Church. He's actually an overseer here. Uh, Blaine speaks every year. If you've not experienced Blaine, uh, buckle up, man. It's going to be good. Uh, Blaine was the youth pastor of the largest youth group in America, number one fastest Christian TV show in the world, 90s star, rock star in the Christian world, and had probably the most epic moral failure of all times, made national news. And um, it was a 25-year addiction that it was secretive, uh, and then it all came out in, in one day and uh, sent him in a tailspin of belief and doubt, walking away from faith church. Uh, he was pretty much you know, exiled from the church. And he's been 10 years now, 11 years, uh, completely free from his addiction. And his goal now is to lead a million men in sexual addiction and recovery. And there's a lot of men in City Church today, you're walking in freedom from sexual sin because of Blaine and his ministry, who have walked with you. And I'm so grateful for him. And he is going to speak next week. And uh, you do not want to miss it, all right? Let's continue. And i, I got to be honest with you, this whole sermon series, there's two that I've had circled. The one on hypocrisy I did a few weeks ago, and then this one today. Because this is one of my greatest struggles kind of growing up in my life. And, and maybe you fall in two different camps. One is you just have a, a legalistic bent. You're just naturally kind of, you, know, you move towards performance or legalism or following the rules. Or maybe you grew up in that home, that church, that school, that just seemed to focus a little bit more on legalism and the rules. Or, or maybe you were simply never taught the gospel. In fact, you ask the majority of people today, how do you get to heaven? They'll say, be a good person and do good things. That's not the right answer, okay? You never taught the gospel. You never really leaned into that. Uh, in my sixth grade year, we lived in Dallas, Texas, and I switched schools in the middle of the year, which is always hard because everybody already has their classes, their friends, and I was part of a public school in North Dallas, and then I went to a, a private school called Lexington Preparatory Academy. Just the name makes me shudder today. <laughs> And I remember going to this school, and everybody already had their friends. Everybody knew the rules. And just learning the rules in this place was a full-time job. In fact, I think we have a yearbook picture of me in sixth grade. Come on now. Look at, look at Pastor Matt. Look at those ears. Come on. 
look like a uh, car with the doors left open, don't I? But I grew into them. And uh, you, you can't tell, but in the picture, just the dress code was crazy. I, I wore a, a blue blazer, and then under that was a red sweater vest with my name embroidered on it. And then under that was the white button-up, and you had to wear a tie every day. Blue slacks, black socks, and penny loafers. Except on Fridays, they let you wear dress shorts with all of that. Come on, who's going to do that? <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I get to wear dress shorts with my penny loafers, you know? And so I remember walking in and, and having all this on and learning the rules. And one of the, the guys next to me was like, hey, dude, just so you know, you can't actually, it's against the rules to put pennies in your loafers. I thought he was joking. I said, are you, are you being serious? He's like, yeah. Like, That's the dumbest rule I've ever heard in my life. Why? And he's like, nobody knows. Okay, here's what I learned about myself and the sinful nature. You don't care about things until someone tells you you can't do it. Have you ever noticed that? It's like I never even cared about putting a penny in my loafer, but right now I want to shove as many in there as humanly possible. I want to put like eight dollars and quarters in there and then hit you over the head with it for just making a stupid rule. And I remember my whole time at that school, it was just all the rules and nobody knew the whys. Nobody. In fact, this was my first taste of real hypocrisy because, like, I would go to Bible class and you'd go to, like, math and history, and then we would go to chapel and people would raise their hands and, and, and we'd worship, and then there was a 30-minute break after school before football practice, basketball practice, whatever season it was, and I remember that 30 minutes you went with the opposite sex somewhere and you did God knows what right after chapel, and I remember looking around saying, at public school, at least people knew they were lost. <laughs> right? Like here, everybody's playing the game. And I, it's just confusing to me. Here I'm in sixth grade, and I'm like, if you're going to rebel, rebel. If you're going to be genuine, be genuine. But how do you raise your hands and go to Bible? And, and I, I just, I can't do that part of it. If you want to know why today, why authenticity is one of my core values, because I, I was raised in a lot of environments where you're like, what? What's happening? Like you look behind the curtain, and, and you just don't like what you see. And here's what I learned, and some of you probably learned this along with me. Any environment that emphasizes rules over relationships will inevitably lead to spiritual frustration, hypocrisy, and or rebellion. It, it has nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else for it to go. Anytime the rules are emphasized over relationship with Jesus, that's the end result. Because there's nowhere else for your faith to take you. It's frustrating and sometimes when people, they have rules, but they don't know why they have the rules, that is the recipe for rebellion, right? I don't know why we can't put pennies in our loafers, but all I know is that I want to. That's, that's what the sinful nature does, doesn't it? If I went up here and I put, I put a big red button or like, hey, we're going to hang out in this room all day, you can do anything, just don't hit the big red button. Some of you are like, I need to touch it, right? <laughs> that's why I, I don't even blame Adam and Eve because I'm like, there's one tree in the garden and if Jesus told you or God told you not to touch it, you'd be like, hmm. I really want to, because <laughs> that's what the sinful nature does. That's the flesh versus the spirit. That's even like Paul in Romans 7, who is warring with the, the law, and all the law makes him do is want to sin more, and then his inability to live up the law. So it's this cycle of shame and guilt and condemnation over and over again, because you just can't meet expectation. There, there's a million topics that we could talk about when it regards to legalism. I, I'm going to talk about the topic of sex. Because I've realized if anything keeps people's attention more, it's, it's sex. And so, why not? Um, and it's honestly one of those topics growing up where I was never taught a biblical ethic of sexuality. And so in the church, what happens a lot of times is the topic's kind of taboo. And if you do bring it up, you just talk about all the, the, the bad things. Like, don't do it. Don't, 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 don't. It's, it's bad. Like, and, and so you grow up and you're just like trying to, trying to resist all the, the urges. And then you have culture over here is telling you, it's like, man, life is, is all about sex. Sex is what sells. So you, you should explore it. In fact, you can't be who you were called to be unless you tap into that part of who you are. And your sexual desires actually can, can, can dictate and tell you who you are and where you're supposed to go. And so we have these conflicting messages and, 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 and I remember growing up and just never really being taught. I do so much premarital counseling today, and if I have a couple who grew up in the church, I will tell you that they probably bring a lot of condemnation and baggage about sex into the marriage, even if they don't have a sexual history. Because what happens is we just say, don't do it, don't think about it, you know, don't touch it, don't look, don't anything, and then all of a sudden you get married and we're like, flip that switch on, and it's good. It's God-glorifying. You should really enjoy it. And people are like, wait, that's a, is, 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 you following with me this morning? 
I deal with that a lot because we were never taught truths about sex. Let me, let me give you some uncomfortable truths about sex, and you don't have to make eye contact with me if you don't want to, all right? Did you know that God designed sex to be practiced within his design, and it's a good thing, right? Sex is not a result of the fall. Sex was in the garden, be fruitful and multiply. Adam and Eve didn't give each other high fives to have sex, you know, they, 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 they were together. Did you know that when two people within God's design of covenant have sex, they bring glory to God? It makes God smile. Th- that verbiage just makes us uncomfortable, right? I say that in premarital counseling and people are like, look down. You know, like, uh, no eye contact. Because it's just, we, we've shoved it over in the corner. Like, we don't talk about that. Did you know uh, another truth is that you can thrive in life completely being fulfilled without being sexually active? Be committed to celibacy or singleness. Like, you're not living life B. It's not like second tier. No, you can thrive fully and know who you are and live out God's plan and, 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 and glorify God in your life without that peace. But if you choose to do that, then God's design is good. But we don't, we don't, we don't talk about those things. See, what legalism does is it places restrictions on certain things or behaviors instead of focusing on God's design or God's heart. We don't talk about God's design or God's heart. We just say, don't do it. If you don't do it, then it's, you, know, you can't mess up. But that's not sustainable, is it? It doesn't work. See, legalism, what happens when I, and it's my upbringing, legalism teaches abstinence without teaching God's goodness or design. Legalism will teach us, if you were a kid in the 90s, you may remember this and you grew up in the church, legalism will tell us that we need to kiss dating goodbye. Come on now, we recovered from that. Instead of teaching us as kingdom people how to walk in godly relationships, right? So if some of you are following this story, last year in 2019, the writer and author of I Kiss Dating Goodbye renounced his faith, right? Not just the book, his faith. But you look at me, you're like, how could you do that? Well, his understanding of the gospel and where it had taken him, I, I would have walked away from that too. That's not God's design. God's design is not for you just to build up such rules and barriers that we miss even why we're doing it. But that's what legalism does. It rips the beauty, the joy, the wonder, the grace for, for, from living a life in Christ. And we do this with other topics. I grew up in a church where you just didn't drink. You didn't touch alcohol. Why? I don't know. Maybe it, it led to dancing. I don't know. Other crazy sins, you know? <laughs> for my Baptist friends, that was for you. Because <laughs> we're holiness. I grew up in that holiness movement. I mean, holiness is not a bad word. We've made it a bad word sometimes by what we do with it. My, my son the other day, you know, he's watching TV and there's beer commercials on. He's like, Dad, do you drink? And I said, son, you know, every once in a while I'll have a drink, you know, but, but not, not, a, not very often. Like, why, why not? I said, well, you know, I'm in a position and a, a place of leadership where I just have to be really careful, even what people see and perceive me, and I'm always just understanding of, of where people are at, and some people, that's their struggle, and so I don't want to put a stumbling block and I'm trying to explain that to him. And I, and I said, I also, you also know that your mom, she grew up in a home with an alcoholic father. That's why Papa's not in your life today. And she's uncomfortable in some of those environments. Even the smell and being around it sometimes makes mom uncomfortable. And I said, I, I don't because I want to honor her. He's like, oh, what if I want to drink? I said, well, buddy, when you're 21, that's a choice that you get to make. And if you want to, you can do that. But let me teach you how you do that well. We're not looking for fulfillment in a drink. If we struggle with self-control, there's personal conviction, then it's probably not something. I said, the scripture just says, be aware. Like, just be sober-minded. You Use wisdom. See, the why is important, isn't it? If I just tell him, no, we don't, we don't drink, what do I do? I, I just stick this over here in this whole you know, like cone of shame and secrecy. And now one day when he gets curious about it, you know what he's going to have to do? He's going to struggle in secret. Oh, I'm going to try it, but I'm not going to tell anybody, no. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell anybody. No, if, if you want to drink, guess what? You can have your first drink with Dad. I'll go with you. I'm going to teach you why we do this. I'm going to teach you how men of God handle these situations. We're going to talk openly about sex. We do that in our family. We have conversations with my older kids. Why? Because the average kid today is exposed to pornography or sexual conversations at age eight. And I'm not going to let them get to my kids before I do. And so I'll, go, I'll walk up to my kids, I'll say, we're going to talk about this, and they're like, oh God, I don't want to. Nope, we're ripping this Band-Aid off. 
And all of a sudden, it's like, we're, we're going to talk about this. What, what questions do you have? Do you know that God designed sex and it's really good? Your mom and I practice regularly. That's when they walk away. <laughs> right? Do you know that when you have questions, because you will, and there's things you don't understand, you, we can talk about that together? And I'm going to rip that Band-Aid off again and again and again because the world's not going to educate my kids about sex. They're just not. I'm not, I'm not going to let them take that. We're going to talk about God's design, that God designed it to be a good thing. We're not going to shove it over in the corner where you just have to feel condemnation every time you think about it. No, we're going to walk out our sexuality in community as kingdom people, even with the next generation, because we have to. If you're taking notes and following along, this is, this is one of these reasons why, you know, parenting, you don't have to be a parent to get this, but in parenting, we, we have to move from rules uh, and boundaries to influence. If, if you don't make that transition, your kids rebel. So why do you have rules and boundaries when they're little? Because you want to try to keep them alive. Some of you right now, it's just keeping them alive. Amen? We've been there. Like our youngest is five now. You know, we have a five, what, seven, eight, and 10-year-old. And so now we're kind of moving into this influence where it's about helping them walk it out. It's the whys of life. And we have to help them make this transition because if we stay in rules and boundaries, guess what? One day they rebel against the rules. But if they understand the why, then they can lean in and not just do the right things for the wrong reasons, but the right things for the right reasons. How many know that's what God wants for you? Because we're preparing our kids to be independent. We're preparing them for real life. That's why we lean into these conversations about sex and alcohol and life. If you're taking note, the carrot at the end of the stick is not the avoidance of sin. That's not what we preach. It is life in the kingdom of God and freedom. This is gospel living. If you don't hear anything else I say, if you're watching online, outside, in here, please get this next part. What I want my kids to see is gospel-inspired holiness. See, holiness is not a bad word. It's a good word. It's being set apart. It's, it's looking like Jesus. We've made it a bad word because we've tried to get there through legalism. And to get there through legalism, you have to fake it to make it, right? And it falls apart. But gospel-inspired holiness is saying, you know why we do this? Because we want to live life in the kingdom of God. You know what life in the kingdom of God is? Freedom and joy and peace. See, don't tell me otherwise. There are people right now that they want to live life in the kingdom, but there's parts of your life where you want to take control. What's one of those? Let's just be honest. Sex. I don't want to live life in God's kingdom in that. I want to live with someone who I'm not married to. That's what's popular. And so there's part of you that think, I'm going to find life in this outside God's design. And let me tell you, that is an endless search that always runs dry. You're not God. God designed life and fulfillment. And what holiness is, is aligning ourselves with God's kingdom and living in it. And guess when that becomes hard? When it comes against what you want to do. What are you going to do Whenever God's kingdom and your kingdom are conflicted, that is how you decide who you serve. There are a lot of people that say, man, I'm, I serve God. I want to live life in the kingdom. You are in the middle of your own kingdom thinking, I got this. Don't you ever tell me that sex outside of God's design leads to life? Most of us in this room have experienced that. We know that that never fulfills. You're always searching for something that doesn't really give you life. It's an endless search. Paul was dealing with this same thing in Corinthians. Here's what the Corinthians were doing. They were saying things that the culture was saying, that everything is permissible for me. I can do this. I can do that. Paul's saying, you guys are flying this white flag of freedom and saying, look at me, I'm free. That's bondage. You're enslaved, but you don't know it. You think it's freedom, but it's slavery. Freedom is living within God's design. Not because the rules tell you so, because you know that that's where you find life. That's not only the life of God's kingdom now, that will be the life of God's kingdom to come. I always tell people, man, if you struggle to live in God's kingdom now, you're going to hate eternity. Right? You're going to hate heaven. Because what it looks like now is what it will look like then, but better, right? Living in God's kingdom. This is what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount. I have tried to get out of the Sermon on the Mount this year, and I just can't. It's, it's, it's restoring my soul right now in such a divided time, because Sermon on the Mount is the clearest reflection of Jesus. 
the, the, the most important teachings of Jesus, of what the kingdom of God looks like. And in the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus is doing is he's showing the people the inability of the law to make you righteous. There's a Greek word, and that's the whole debate is how are we made righteous? And they're saying, follow the law. But here's what they did. They would go right up to the law. Have you ever done that? Like right up to the rules? Like I didn't break the rules, but I'm right on the line. And that's what the religious leaders did. And Jesus would say, that doesn't do it. Now, until you start dealing with the heart, right? Until you start dealing with what's internal, you can never live this gospel-inspired holiness. You can never actually fulfill the law, which is love. No, it's always just going to be something manufactured. If you're taking notes, the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation to life and freedom and a progression towards a life of agape love. What Jesus is doing in the most important sermon ever given is he's showing you how love is the true fulfillment of everything. Not did I obey the rules, but is it loving? Is it overflowing from a heart from, of love? That's what Jesus is doing. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is overturning the misguided source of righteousness. So the scribes and Pharisees focusing on the law, and Jesus says, don't focus on the law. Don't focus on your actions. Focus on the heart because all the actions flow from the heart, right? So if you feel like you're on this treadmill of performance, that you're on this wheel like a, like a yeah, hamster just running faster and faster and you're getting nowhere, you're probably trying to do it through your own performance. Get off the treadmill and learn to live in God's grace and his goodness. Jesus is saying that our actions don't emerge from nothing. Our actions faithfully reveal what is in our hearts. So in order to fulfill the law, we must begin focusing on our hearts. I want you to see what Jesus is doing in the most famous sermon. He's actually comparing and contrasting the law versus love. So the law will say, uh, don't murder. If you want to deal with the heart, don't even let anger burn in your heart. Oh, the law says don't commit adultery? Yeah, that's great. But love would say don't even let lust build up. Oh, the law says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, because that's just how the world rolls. The, the, the world rolls. The, the, the heart would say this, if someone strikes you on one cheek, guess what? Give them the other cheek. If someone wants your tunic, give them, man, give them your pants, your, your socks, your shoes as well. Someone asks you to go one mile, go, go, go 10 miles with them. That, that's what love does. See, the law is like, how can I fulfill the least amount? Love overflows, doesn't it? That's what you and I want. We want to be in a place where we don't have to manufacture the fruit of the Spirit. But sometimes it's easier to fake it than it is to produce the heart. Producing the heart is it's hard work. It's hard work. But to produce a kingdom life, we must first produce a kingdom heart. You cannot produce kingdom actions unless you deal with your heart. And so if you're in this room, if you're watching the line outside and you're like, man, why can I not get myself to produce fruit? What are you focused on? Are you trying to do the right things? I'm sorry, but that falls apart. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, the Sermon on the Mount. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from the thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. There is a lot of anger and division in our world right now. Can I tell you those things are not flowing out of a vacuum or of nothingness? No, they are revealing the pain that people are experiencing. And they don't know what to do with it. See, and as kingdom people, our goal is love, right? But their goal may be being right, being justified. I'm just telling you right now, it's okay to be opinionated, but if you care more about your opinion about COVID or whether we should go back to school or politics or the million other things, more than loving people, I would ask you to reevaluate your faith and theology. Our goal is love, and sometimes love is resistance, and sometimes love is taking a stand, but sometimes right now we just want to be right. We just want to be justified. We want to be heard, and we miss being loving. She would say the fulfillment of the law is agape love. 
And I guarantee you the people that you're wanting to, to fight against right now probably need to be loved more than ever before. See, but a bad tree doesn't bear good fruit, does it? And a good tree will overflow in good fruit. They're going to put this picture of an apple tree on here. I, I think this is what we desire. We all want to live the life where the fruit of the Spirit just overflowed, don't we? I mean, that's, that's what I want. I don't know if you want that, but I don't want to try to manufacture and work for the fruit of the Spirit. But, but here's what legalism does to this, and I know this is kind of, kind of a stupid uh, example, but I, I think growing up a lot of times, what legalism did in my life is it said, you know what, as long as you look the part, right? As long as you look the part. So, so what we would do is this. We would just take some fruit, wrap something around it, right? Saying, man, Look how holy I am. <laughs> Look at the fruit that is growing in my life. If only you were as holy as me. Right? Now, I know this looks stupid. But can I tell you this is what legalism is? It's faking it. It's saying instead of dealing internally to produce this, we can do this and nobody will say otherwise. Because, man, this looks like holiness, doesn't it? We're doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. And I think Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount would look to the, the scribes and the Pharisees and say, this doesn't do it. Like this just, you can't manufacture fruit. You can't do the right things for the wrong reasons. Can, can I just tell you today, this right here is a faith that you walk away from. It's a faith that you walk away from. Because all of us here in this room, we're like, it's not real. It's not sustainable. This doesn't lead to life. Are you kidding me? You just duct tape an apple to a tree. Can I just tell you, this tree was already dead before the sermon series, so no tree was killed in the making of the sermon, all right? <laughs> this tree had been in our home. He was dying for a long time now. I think he gave his life because he knew I needed a sermon illustration. <laughs> This is what legalism does. And yet, if we're honest with ourselves, some of us, that's what we're trying to do. And you're frustrated. And you're like, I don't know if this Christian thing is real. I just can't keep doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And I would say, I get it. But that's not the gospel. See, I want my kids, I'll get emotional talking about my kids. I want my kids to see gospel-inspired holiness. I want them to be passionate about the things of God. I don't want them to be rule followers. Rule followers walk away. People who see the gospel and want relationship with Jesus lean in. They push past the uncomfortable parts of faith, and they lean in because they know they're loved. We, we throw around this, world, go, this word gospel a lot here, and people think, oh, I, I know the gospel. Gospel is a well that never runs dry. You never hit the bottom of it. It speaks to your past, your present, to your future. It speaks to your idols. It speaks to your insecurities and your struggles. And so we are con constantly fighting for the gospel in our lives. Fighting for it. Gospel-inspired holiness. Three things just to recap. And then we're going to close this morning. Number one, how do we move from a legalism to a life in the kingdom? Number one, you cultivate your heart over the rules or behavior. You have to cultivate your heart. Let the fruit naturally flow from your heart and your life. Number two is this. You fight to remain gospel-centered. You fight. What I just described in this message today is legalism. The other ditch over here is called license. And license is really popular right now. License says, because of the grace and the goodness of God, I can live however I want to live. That is not the gospel. There is a place of gospel-centeredness here that says, because I've been redeemed, because I've been saved and rescued, I choose to live a life in God's kingdom as God designed it, and I want to be holy because I want to look like Jesus. Do you see that? There's a lot of people that will try to fake it out through legalism, and there's a lot of people that will say, you know what, your actions and how you live just don't matter because God's love and grace covers you. That is cheap grace. No, God's grace has rescued us and saved us and redeemed us in order to bring us into his kingdom of life. That's why Jesus, whenever this woman, remember when this woman is, she's about to get stoned to death by a bunch of people because she was caught in adultery. 
Jesus, like you who without sin cast the first stone, everybody walks away. He says he loves her. He looks at their, go and leave your life and live life in the kingdom. Go leave the chasing of life and sexual experiences and man after man after man who have only left you empty. Enter into my kingdom. Our prayer is that we live such gospel-inspired lives in front of our kids that one day they choose to walk in faith because they've seen it. You with me? That's what God wants for you. If if your default towards God is continual disappointment and you've got to work, you've got to do something, you need an overhaul of your understanding of God. I'm constantly amazed as a pastor how many people misunderstand the heart of God. He's not disappointed in you. He loved you so intently that he chased after you. I have a picture I keep to remind me. It's of the dad in the story of the prodigal son. I know I've preached that a million times here. The dad in the story of the prodigal son gets caught up in the moment. Like he's a Middle Eastern patriarch and they didn't run or do things like that because it was undignified. And yet in the story, he sees his son coming and he picks up his cloak and garments and he begins to take off. Why? Because God gets caught up in the moment with us. That's what God does with you and I. And yet we're over here thinking like, no, just don't live up to expectation. Missed my prayer time. Haven't had a Devo in about four months. Jesus is just inviting us, inviting us, inviting us. That's a gospel that you want to live into, right? That's a gospel that transforms you. That's a love that changes your heart. And Jesus says all the rules and regulations of the world just don't do it. They leave you empty. And guess what? You're going to walk away from that faith. But you will not walk away from being loved. Amen? Let me ask you these questions as we wrap up. I mean, do you have a tendency to lean towards a legalistic heart? Is that maybe just your bent? If so, just own it. Man, yeah, that's me. I tend to emphasize the rules over relationship, or I grew up in that environment and I know it's not the way, but I just have a tendency. Why are you doing it? You don't have to fake it with God. Have you been hurt or wounded from legalism like you grew up in that church in that environment? I remember I love my church. I love the people that helped disciple me and raise me, but there was this mentality of like, have you read your Bible today and you prayed? Because if not, you better. And I just always lived with this mentality of like, I'm just not enough. I can't do it. And I was 25 years old before I got a revelation of God's grace. That it was now I want to be with him, not because someone told me to, but because I'm just in love with Jesus. Are you experiencing gospel-inspired holiness and the freedom of living a life in Christ? If there's an area of your life where you're not living in the kingdom of God, there's only one response, and it's not easy. It's repentance. It's letting go of your way and saying, Christ, I surrender and submit my life to you, all of it, the part that I don't want to. No, I'd rather hold on to my finances. No, I'd rather do that my way. I'd rather divine my own sexual ethic. I'd rather chase my desires. See, that, that's, that's real life. No, I'd rather develop my own political stance instead of living life and allowing the kingdom of God to shape it. Maybe repentance. If you would this morning, stand to your feet with me. If you're outside with us, once you stand to your feet, we're going to take communion together if you want, guys want to begin to prepare. hold those elements and we'll take them together in just a minute every week we come to the table together because the power we need to live this life is not found in our own ability so we come to the table we understand our inability to save ourselves and our need for a savior I don't know what you're coming to the table this morning, and I know usually we would be getting out of our seats and we walk to the table, but in the time of COVID, we're doing communion to go. And I don't know what you need. I'm just here to tell you that God is here to meet you wherever you are at. 
If you don't know Jesus, he is here in this moment to meet you exactly where you are. You are coming broken in soul and spirit. Man, I, I just believe he's here. In our time of silence in first service, I wasn't in here this second service, but in first service, I just, I literally, during the time of silence, I got a picture of like, God is this huge bird <laughs> and literally his wings just covering over us and he's just saying, hey, just come and let me cover you and just rest in my, in my covering. Maybe that's what you need. I said, I, I'm in control of everything. I've got you. Rest in me. Whatever you need, that's why we come to the table every week because I don't know what you need, but the Spirit of God does. And the Spirit of God is here to meet you and move you to the place that, that you need. Sometimes it's conviction and that's difficult but necessary and sometimes it's just reminding you of the love of God. Sometimes it's speaking to hearts and souls. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered around his disciples and he took the bread and he passed it around. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. He said, every time you eat of this, I want you to remember me. Remember that my brokenness has made you whole. Remember that I was ripped apart so that you could be put back together and be given life. Let's take the body of Christ together. And Jesus took the cup and he passed it around. He said, this is my blood, the new covenant. It's been shed for you. You know why I don't fear the future personally? Because one day all of us will stand before God. And if you are in Christ, God does not see your sin, your rebellion. He sees the blood of Jesus. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear in Christ. Let's take the blood of Jesus together. Let's take these next few minutes just to worship. Sing together.